Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, Friday, 3 July, 1863, 3.30 p.m. On the third and final day of the largest military engagement ever to take place on the North American continent, two and a half hours since the launching of the, of the famous ill-fated Pickett's Charge elements of the 26th North Carolina Infantry Regiment, one Corps Army of Northern Virginia advanced nearly to the crest of Cemetery Ridge, where they are repulsed and turned back by defenders from the 69th Pennsylvania and the 72nd Pennsylvania. The spot of the farthest northward advance by the North Carolinians is today known as the high water mark of the Confederacy, and a granite monument stands on the location, signifying that in, in the sense both of the battle and of the larger war, this spot was where the tide turned. In the sense of the battle, there had been chances for the rebels to win the thing on the second day, but with the failure of Pickett's charge on the third day resulting in the near-total annihilation of Pickett's entire division. No matter what happened anywhere else on the battlefield that day, the battle was now going to be a strategic and tactical defeat for the Confederates. In the sense of the larger war, there were still nearly two years of fighting left, some of the worst fighting of the war, in fact, but when Pickett's charge was repulsed by the Pennsylvanians, when it became academic that the battle was lost and Lee's gambit of invading the Union had failed, it also became academic that the war also was lost. There would be no negotiated peace, which, of course, was the Confederacy's only chance at remaining in existence at the close of hostilities. There was never going to be an outright Confederate military victory due to the wild imbalances in population and industrial capacity. And a rebel capitulation was going to be the only way that this thing ended. I got to thinking about that story this morning, the story of the high water mark of the Confederacy, when I was thinking about today's election in Virginia, where the polls have closed about an hour ago as I'm starting to record this, so by the time the video goes up we may well know already who won the thing, but from where we sit right now it looks like Glenn Youngkin, Captain Milktoast, the sweater vest warrior, has all the momentum and a better than a puncher's chance of winning the state house from a guy Terry McAuliffe who who could have won this election just by saying nothing seriously if he had skipped the debates never uttered a word in public he wins this thing probably by 10 but in one of the stupidest debate gaffes in modern american political history he blurts out that stupid remark about how parents shouldn't be telling schools what to teach and between that unforced error and the Loudoun County rape scandal, he takes an election where he, he just needs to remain alive and hold serve in order to win, and he turns it into a national referendum on wokeness. And it looks like he may very well lose because of it. Now, the Democrats, as we well know, have had just about as bad a year as you can have when you won the election last year and you control literally everything. They have a president who 56% of his own party's voters want replaced in the next election, whose approval rating for a first-year elected president, allegedly, is at historically unprecedented levels of awfulness. They can't pass any legislation. Their factions are infighting over whether the party should be, like, Pol Pot-level socialist or just Bernie Sanders-level socialist, and 10 months of their governance has resulted in a country where three-quarters of the people think we're on the wrong track and we're basically screwed. But at least we didn't shit our pants while we were meeting with the Pope. Allegedly. So if Terry McAuliffe loses this election in Virginia, and particularly if he loses by a wide margin to a candidate who's really not all that impressive, in an election where all the leverage and all the baked-in advantages favored him, then there is going to be a nuclear-level freakout because the Democrats then will be in just about the worst position a party can be in that won a presidential election, allegedly and held one House of Congress and flipped the other into their control. If Youngkin wins, and especially if he wins decisively in an election that, that the electorate has come to view as being less about do we want the Republican governor or the Democrat governor, and more as a referendum on whether people want woke leftist identitarianism to be the lynch, linchpin of the public school curriculum, once the historians have had a century or two to think about it, they may well record that the 2021 Virginia governor's election was the high-water mark of wokesterism. 
just as we today view that stone monument by that grove of trees in southern Pennsylvania as the point where the cause of the Confederacy crested the proverbial hill and began the inexorable slide downward toward defeat and ultimate destruction. Another thing those historians may well record, which is difficult for us to see here today at ground level, is that the, this incursion of wokesterism into the public school classroom and its ultimate banishment by parents and voters was about an activist government attempting to establish a state religion and to forcibly inculcate it into small children through the conduit of compliantly woke activist teachers in the public schools. Because, spoiler alert, if you're the sort of person who would clutch their pearls in horror at the suggestion of public school children having Bible study classes, but you have no problem with classes where kids are encouraged to segregate themselves according to race, to assign different people different levels of moral worth according to their racial or ethnic heritage, and to define themselves according to the grievances of their long-dead ancestors, then you need to have a series of fairly difficult conversations with yourself because you're a clueless idiot who lacks all perspective. Isn't that right, Jim Eagle? From high atop the battlements of Castle Curmudgeon, where, full disclosure, yes, I did wear a sweater vest on maybe half a dozen occasions when I was of middle school age. Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. America and all ships at sea. Welcome to the program. I am your eponymous host and humble servant. And I do apologize for having misspoken and said see you Monday when I was signing off in Friday's video for it. It did slip my mind that this week is, is one of the new alternate schedule weeks, as is next week, by the way, so... No Monday videos until 15 November. And there will be a pop quiz, so I trust that you're all taking detailed notes. Unless, of course, you used up all the blank pages in your notebook because your other teacher made you write, I will not be a cis-heteronormative white devil colonizer 2,000 times. In which case, I obviously am happy to give you a reprieve. So, as I alluded to in the open, and maybe I'm just being my normal, hopelessly optimistic self, but I think there's increasingly a feeling in the air that we are passing peak woke. That people have had just about enough of it. And we can look forward to watching the, the steady decline of the wokesteries religion and right, right through to seeing the whole rotten edifice crumble into dust to a future where ten years from now, Henry Rogers... Sorry... Dr. Ibram X. Kendi is working at a car wash and not doing a very good job because he's a dumbass. 30 or so years in the future, it will be easy to view wokesterism as one of those weird cultural phenomena that, are, that arrived suddenly and left just as fast, like the Pet Rock or Millie Vanilli or home fallout shelters. A few months ago, the founder of Black Lives Matter, our good friend Patrice Cullors, she decided to cash in her chips take her four houses and exit the scene. And a person like that, someone who did nothing but make a hashtag on Twitter and managed to become a wealthy, influential political figure because of it, when a person like that senses that there's no more ill-gotten money to be made when the crudent course of, action, course of action is to just count one's winnings and quietly exit the stage, they usually are not wrong. Oh, and before I forget, I'm glad I, I'm glad I brought up Mr. Rogers, sorry, Dr. Kendi. Because, look, I've been telling you for quite a while that this guy is not exactly the most luminous star in the constellation of the human intellect, but he committed a self-owning the other day that even for a certifiable race-hustling grifter moron like himself was just breathtaking in its delicious stupidity. If they ever make a Mount Rushmore for people accidentally owning themselves on Twitter, inadvertently discrediting their entire idiotic worldview... This is one of the things that, frankly, should be on there. When you're Dr. Kendi and you see a news story about white people doing something bad, you don't think twice about it. You just hit the retweet button, or whatever it is that one does when one retweets something. Since I've never written a tweet or been to Twitter, I will happily confess to not knowing how any of that works. This particular story, it turns out, was about white kids lying about their ethnicity in college admissions and claiming minority status so as to have a better shot at being admi admitted to, to the university to which they were implying. So Mr. Rogers, Dr. Kendi, the IXK, if you will, he sees the headline on this story, and since he's not a smart man or a deep thinker, he, he takes the most intellectually vacuous surface-level interpretation and just runs with it, 
Uh, will you look at that? White kids disadvantaging minorities. When will this systemic racism end? Except, wait, pump the brakes, Henry. We got to talk about this. Because isn't your entire dumbass worldview predicated on the, the idea that whites in this country are unfairly systemically advantaged by virtue of their whiteness? So then, how come then we have this phenomenon of white kids pretending to be non-white because they think it helps their chances of being admitted to the university of their choice? But to his credit, Henry... Ibram, Mr. Rogers, Dr. Kendi, the IXK, he seemed to realize pretty quickly that he had done a fairly stupid and self-defeating thing by retweeting this article. Either that, or one of his less stupid associates sent him a horrified private message that said, DELETE FUCKING EVERYTHING! Because it was pretty quick, within 15 or 20 minutes, I think, that he deleted the tweet and thought he could just play it cool like it never happened. But was it quick enough? Oh no. No, it was not. If you're a public figure, whether you have that status, deservedly or undeservedly, when you tweet or retweet a thing, even if you delete it five seconds after, it is too damn late. Somebody was watching and they have got the screenshot. So Kendi was all over the fake news channels yesterday in damage control mode, just lying out his dreadlocked little ass about why he actually retweeted an article that discredits his entire made-for-profit worldview. But dude you deleted the retweet almost immediately, which sort of discredits any rationale you try to come with up with after the fact for why, oh no, there really was a good reason why I did that retweet, and then immediately deleted it, hoping no one would notice. But like I said, folks, this guy is not exactly the sharpest knife in the shed. He may have a fake doctorate, but nobody will ever accuse him of being a rocket surgeon. And speaking of people who are fucking retarded, another good friend of the program... Colin Kaepernick, he's out with a brand new Netflix documentary, and I considered watching it just so I could do a long-form review, but then I decided, just like I did with the Fauci documentary and the Mayor Pete documentary, that there's a limit to how much I am willing to suffer for my art. Now, Mr. Kaepernick, just like Dr. Kendi, is, is one of the intellectual thought leaders of the American left, and just like Dr. Kendi, he is neither a smart man nor a deep thinker. He is quite fabulously wealthy, though. In, in fact, it's not unfair to say that nobody has ever made more money out of sucking at their job than Mr. Kaepernick has. Nor is it unfair to say Mr. Kaepernick probably gets paid more money for doing less work than any single person in North America. Now, what is Colin Kaepernick's professional claim to fame? Well, he once quarterbacked a team to the Super Bowl. But so did Vince Ferragamo, so did Stan Humphreys, so did Chris Chandler, so did Rex freaking Grossman. So where are their Netflix documentaries? Colin Kaepernick, and you have to give credit where credit is due, he's, he is better at capitalism than he is at football. Which I suppose is ironic since he pretends to be some sort of communist sympathizer, but did you ever notice... Americans who pose as Marxist-Leninist sympathizers, they, they seem to always do it as part of a marketing ploy, and it always seems to bring in tremendous amounts of cash. And you have to love a country where the easiest way to exploit the capitalist system for personal fiduciary gain is by pretending to be an anti-capitalist. Kaepernick had one really good NFL season. He had another season that could be described as nominally above average for the rest of his career, average at best, hopeless at worst. And he never made a peep about hating his country or hating the cops or hating free market economies until the week after he got his ass benched in favor of the immortal Blaine Gabbard. The, the first week after he lost the starting job was the first week he started doing the anthem kneeling routine and he got so much undeserved attention for it he kept doing it. This is great. I still get paid starting quarterback money, but I don't have to actually play football. And I can still get just as much media attention by being an asshole who refuses to stand for the national anthem. But even in his wildest dreams, I don't think Kaepernick and his handlers could have imagined this guy would, would wind up making more money as a fake social justice martyr than he ever did playing football. I don't think they could have imagined... Five or six years later, they'd still be running a con where a significant number of people actually believe this idiot was blacklisted from the NFL for his political views, as opposed to the reality of the matter, which is that he's a former decent quarterback who got benched and then cut and then not re-signed by anybody because he isn't any good at his damn job. 
Because, yeah, the NFL totally blacklists people for having woke political views. The NFL, whoa, they can't stand wokesterism. They just hate that stuff. Anyway, it's come to my attention, as I'm sure it also has to yours, that, that in his brand new Netflix documentary, Mr. Kaepernick compares the NFL draft combine to a 19th century slave auction. But not any old slave auction, mind you. This is one of those special slave auctions where the slaves work their entire lives for the opportunity to voluntarily attend, and the ones who are deemed most impressive by the assembled slave buyers will make more money in the next three or four years than the average American worker does in two lifetimes. So yeah, as you can plainly see, the 21st century NFL draft combine is quite obviously a direct analog to your typical antebellum deep south slave auction. And all these years, we've just been too dumb and too clueless to see it. We needed, we needed the intellectual guidance and the leadership of Mr. Colin Kaepernick in order to see the monstrosity of our own thinking. And boy, we sure are ashamed of ourselves now. Meanwhile, there is a guy in the NBA who is everything they claim Kaepernick is. They being the woke-tastic mainstream sports media and the American race-hustling left more broadly. The standard pro-Kaepernick narrative which stands in contravention to literally all of the facts, says that this guy has lost his livelihood and suffered all of these horrible depredations and indignities. He's a political martyr who's been relegated to the professional wilderness for having the temerity to stand on principle and speak truth to power. And of course, that's all complete bullshit. But there is another guy in sports for whom all those statements are true, who really is standing on principle, who really is making a sacrifice, who is losing a hell of a lot because he refuses to go along with something he feels is wrong and un-American, and his name is Kyrie Irving of the Brooklyn Nets. He's the best player on his team, one of the better players in the league, and he's currently suspended without pay because he refuses to abide by the NBA's vaccine mandate. Whereas Kaepernick never gave up a damn thing. He was an overpriced backup quarterback who got cut and didn't get picked up because he wasn't any good. Kyrie Irving is the guy who is actually living up to the slogan that Nike put on their stupid Colin Kaepernick billboards. Believe in something, even if it means giving up everything. Kyrie Irving's reason for refusing the vaccine is the simple and correct one. He doesn't go off into the weeds talking about freedom or bodily autonomy. He just says, look, this is America. In America, we don't make people undergo unwanted medical procedures as a condition of keeping their job. And that is all that needs to be said. Nobody owes anybody else any damn explanation for why they don't want to get the jab. And Kyrie Irving says he's standing up for all those people for exactly that reason, and because it's not enough when the only people willing to take a stand are the ordinary, everyday people with no voice and no power. So Kyrie Irving is using the platform and the voice and the power that he has as one of the top players in the NBA to have the backs of the millions of people who don't want to go along with the mandates because they think it's wrong and they are willing to put their money where their mouths are. And Kyrie Irving is putting his money where his mouth is to the tune of around $300,000 for every game check he misses. So you tell me whether this guy or Colin Kaepernick is the real man of principle. So, so the numbers from Virginia have started rolling in, and as I sat down to, be, to begin recording this, something like 60% of the precincts were reporting, and Yunkin was leading by 11, so unless something pretty drastic happens, it looks like the score won't be close enough to even attempt any funny business or any shenanigans, which is the approach you have to take if you're the Republicans. You have to win by a sufficiently wide margin that it's impossible to steal the election, because you can't steal a landslide. And it looks like in Virginia, where Joe Biden won the state by 10 points last year, Glenn Yunkin is winning this year by a similar margin. In other words, in Virginia, powered by the backlash against wokesterism in public schools, there has been something like a 20-point shift away from Democrats and toward Republicans in just one year's time. And that's pretty remarkable. And that's it for me. Here's wishing everyone a pleasant tomorrow. I will see you Thursday. Do not comply. Get off my lawn.